I'm really excited about this lesson this morning, which means I may speak twice as fast, so I'll try really hard not to do that. Um, this could potentially be our last lesson in 1 Corinthians, I, I said as I started to write this out, but this will not be our last lesson. Um, I remember a sermon really well in my childhood. Uh, it was Mother's Day, and in my hometown, we had three Baptist churches, um, and, and if you were in one of the other Baptist churches, you didn't talk to those people. They were considered unclean. Um, but it was Mother's Day, so those of us who were, uh, my, my family at Calvary were going to be with my mom's family at First Baptist, which was a super no-no, and it's crazy that I remember that as a kid, but we were there, and I remember what the pastor preached on. Pastor Darrow was, was the, the pastor then, Steve Darrow, a great man. I learned a lot from him, um, and he was talking about how to have a home sweet home, and he was talking about Isaac and Rebecca, but I remember about 15 minutes into the message, he said, I wish somebody would kill that clock. I wish somebody would just blow it up. And I remember thinking as a kid, like, like why does he hate clocks? Um, and it, I'm normally known for being somewhat brief, but as of late, I have understood his angst with the timekeeping device on the back wall. So let's jump in before I waste any more of our precious time telling you about someone who, uh, who was mad at a clock. First Corinthians, we're just going to read two verses this morning. We're going to read them over and over and work our way through them. Verses 13 and 14. First Corinthians chapter 16. Verses 13 and 14. Paul says this, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong, let all your things be done with charity. So here Paul is making some hard and fast statements. He's not pulling any punches. And I think had the Corinthians followed these principles that we're talking about this morning, they wouldn't have found themselves in such a mess. I think 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians would have been such cosmically shorter books if there would have even been a need for 2 Corinthians. Um, but our first command here is watch ye, watch ye. I wonder, you know, as these were, we, I try to put myself in the mindset, right, of what was happening. So Paul wrote this letter. And I wonder when the church at Corinth got this letter and they got to this point, I wonder if they were like, well, what does Paul mean? Or I wonder if they knew what Paul meant by saying, watch ye. See, because for us, it's really easy. We have the rest of the Bible. We can look at other places where we have watch ye, and we can see what Paul meant. And the first place that came to my mind with watch ye was Matthew 26, 40 and 41, where they're in the garden. And Jesus said, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, what? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. Based on these verses, I think we can tell what the opposite of watching is, and that's being asleep, not paying attention, not being aware, not being alert. Time and time again, Jesus told these disciples what was about to happen. And they didn't know what was about to happen. They didn't understand as he was telling them the different times that he was about to go to the cross, that he was going to be buried and rose again. They weren't quite grasping it. And I think, honestly, uh, it's human nature, but the more we're around something, the more familiar we become with it, the more we're not cautious about it, the, the less we pay attention to it. And I venture to guess that the disciples began um, to get used to being with Jesus. They began to take his presence for granted. Sometimes they didn't watch as closely the thing that he was doing or pay attention to the words that he was saying as they could. Now, we don't get to watch Jesus as they did, and we can't necessarily watch the Holy Spirit, though he's with us every day. We know Moses lived, and the way that Moses lived, it tells us in Hebrews, is that he lived as seeing him who is invisible. He lived every day as if he could see Jesus standing next to him. Jesus instructed them to watch and pray. And when you're watching and when you're praying, you won't enter into temptation. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Be sober. And the case of, of the disciples there, they were sleepy, which is less than sober. Watch, be sober. It's hard to watch if you're not sober. It's hard to watch if your mind has been altered. And, and, and one of the ways that we can alter our mind, studies are showing now more and more, is by not getting enough sleep. Um, be vigilant. The word vigilant means to keep careful watch for trouble or danger. What dangerous thing should we be watching for? The devil. He's looking, he's trying to get into your life any way that he can. Music, TV, books, audiobooks, persons that you work with, billboards on the way home, somebody's bumper sticker, computers. He's trying to get into your life. 
And more than he's trying to get into your life, he's looking for a way into the life of your family. He's looking to a way in, for a way in your wife's life or your husband's life. And mama and daddy, he's actively looking into a way for your kid's life. And can I be honest with you? Most of the time, he doesn't have to look too hard because all he has to do to get into your kid's life is get you in the flesh and have you acting in the flesh in front of them. I look at my kids and they're amazing. I see some of the best parts of myself in them, but I also see some of my weaknesses, some of my sins that I struggle with. The devil doesn't need a TV to get in my kid's bedroom or get into their mind. He doesn't need them to be on the internet. He doesn't need them to be in a public school. All he needs is for me to not be yielded to the spirit in front of them. So mama and daddy, we have got to watch out for the devil in our own lives, but we've got to watch out for the devil in our own lives for the sake of our kids. The devil wants to destroy your family. A long time ago, I gave the ridiculous analogy, and some of you are not here. I gave the ridiculous analogy of if somebody were going to attack our church, they said, we're, we're coming to attack Cross and Crown Baptist Church. We're coming in three yellow Mazda Miatas with roll bars and 50 cows mounted on the top. We'd be like, that's not a problem. Yellow Mazda Miata, like we see one of those, we'll take care of it. We'd be looking for yellow Mazda Miatas. Any Miata that came by, we'd be like, hey, are they going to change the color of that? Could that one be yellow? That one's a little bit orangish. Is that, is that reddish? That's, is that, we'd be so paranoid, if you would. We'd be so observant of any yellow Mazda Miata, whether it had a machine gun or not. We'd be looking at it going, is that the one? But time and time again, we're told to watch. We're told to be sober because the devil's going to attack us. And the devil attacks us, and we go, I didn't see that coming. We should have seen that coming. We're told the devil's going to attack us. We're told the devil wants to destroy our family. And families get attacked, and they get destroyed, and they go, I didn't see that coming. We should have seen that coming. We should have been watching for it, just like we would watch. If you were going to work, and somebody said, I'm going to fight you at work, you'd be looking for that person. You'd be trying to avoid the fight. We should be trying to avoid... When the devil is going to attack us, we should be doing everything we can to protect ourselves and our families against those attacks. But the devil knows when to attack. He does. He knows when you're weak. He knows when Pastor Davis is weak. He knows when I'm weak. And he's looking for not just opportunities to attack you. He's looking for opportunities to attack this church. We've got to be watching. Paul said it to Timothy this way. Uh, Timothy 2, 4, um, to preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Here's the watch part. You're like, it didn't say watch though. Here's the watch part. But watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. What was he to watch for? All things. But in the preceding verses... He's talking about watching for false doctrine and watching for false teachers. Pastor Davis and I are so careful to teach you the Bible, not necessarily what Baptists teach or what any other group teach, and we confront people who are teaching things that are not necessarily found in the Bible. We're very careful to teach the Bible and not tradition. We have to be able to watch out for false doctrine and for false teachers. The most dangerous thing that you or I or any Christian can do today, I think, because we could say a lot of things like that. Always do this, never do that. The most dangerous this. I think I could argue we could have a conversation that the most dangerous thing is not knowing your Bible. There are so many false doctrines that are based on part of a verse, and they sound great. But when you see the whole verse, you're like, wait a minute, that's not, that's not what that says there. Or they may be based on a verse ripped entirely out of context. And when you see the verse in its context, you go, that's not what the author meant by that. That's not what Paul was saying there. So when we look for a topic, we try to find a proper context. We don't just grab a verse and pull it out to prove any point. There are so many worldly philosophies that use a verse out of context or just use part of a verse. We've got to be watching. We've got to be looking. We must know what the truth is so we can false, so we can spot what's false, so we can see what the perversion is. Remember what Eve said to the devil? He said, hath God not said... And then he paraphrased, and then he added just a little bit. And the same thing is happening to you and I today. A coworker will come up to me and say, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say? And the thing that comes out of their mouth might sound like what the Bible says, but if we don't know our Bibles, we won't know the difference. Paul said it to the Ephesians this way. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. 
redeeming the time because the days are evil. We don't have to ask if the days are evil. We're all well acquainted with the days that are evil, that we're living in those days. Circumspectly, 360 degree awareness, paying attention to those things that are going on around us. When we consider this literally in our day and age, it amazes me how many people have a case of 45 degree syndrome. They're just, their head is at 45 degrees staring at a device, 45 degree syndrome. And that's a literal thing. People aren't literally aware. But even more than being literally aware, we need to be spiritually aware. Are you aware that you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places? I think had the church in Corinth been watching, had they been looking for the attacks of the devil, had they known what was true, then again, we wouldn't have seen these letters be as large as they were. We might have seen a different kind of letter. It may have been a letter of encouragement, a letter of exhortation. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. It's important when you read faith to make a distinction because there are two different kinds of faith in the Bible. There is faith as in believing, the faith um, that results in action, the faith in the finished work that Jesus did on the cross that results in the action of repentance and living a new life in Christ. But what Paul is talking about here is not faith. He's talking about the faith, which means the body of beliefs. Jude gave us this charge in Jude 1.3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was delivered once unto all the saints. Earnestly contend for the faith. Stand fast in the faith. In verse 58 of the last chapter, it says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So earnestly contend for, stand fast in, don't be moved from. From what? The teachings of the Bible, and we could argue more specifically, the teachings that were taught by the apostles. So many churches in our day and age are in error because they're looking for something new. They're looking for something exciting. And there's a movement that's been afoot since the early 70s called ecumenicism. Um, and now it's beginning to get some pretty ridiculous traction. Now it's beginning to really have some effect. Now it's beginning to take over. And that idea is that we tear down the walls of, of doctrine. We tear down the walls between us and anybody else, and we only talk about the things that we have in common. We only talk about love, and that's straight from the devil. Isaiah 55 says this, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take down the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and I will break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come upon it briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain, that no rain upon it. Here in the context, God is talking to Israel. He's telling them that he made them a nation. He put up hedges to protect them, but they didn't want to follow his rules. They began, as it says, whoring around on him. They began cheating on him. They began committing spiritual adultery and worshiping the false gods of the other nations that were around them. And God says, I put those walls there for a reason. I put those walls there to protect you. And those walls are gone now. Many of you have done some work to a house from time to time. And if you bought a house that you didn't design the floor plan of, you come to the conclusion, man, this wall is in my way. <laughs> like, my life would be easier if this wall were not here. So you go, you know, I'm going to move this wall. And maybe you, 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 you get out the sledgehammer and you go to work and you remove that wall. And everything seems fine. Everything seems great. And you come to the conclusion because there's a sag in the ceiling. That was what we call a load-bearing wall. <laughs> And then the roof falls in. There was a reason that wall was there. There was a purpose that the builder put that wall there. Separation is there for a reason. Many churches have torn down the wall of separation and worldliness, and they've trampled the fruit, and thorns and thistles are now growing in the midst of the church. Why? Because they tore down the wall. They lowered their standards. They became weak here and there. We must stand fast in. We must contend for can I be honest with you? Not something that's kind of silly, but I think it helps to make the point. Um, I'm frustrated with anyone who was of voting age on April 10th, 1986. April 10th, 1986 was when the most recent Federal Firearms Act went through. And because of that most recent Federal Firearms Act, it would cost me about $16,000 to own a machine gun right now. But the thing is, 
It seemed like a great idea then. Nobody really cared then. Nobody needs machine guns then. And I'm not necessarily saying I need a machine gun now, but <clears throat> it would be super awesome. Who doesn't want a machine gun? Um, <clears throat> so anyhow, for they could have contended against that, though people who could have fought against that. They could have voted against that, but they just let that through. And now because of that, I wasn't even born yet, but it affects me, and it affects my children, and it affects my children's children. What happened then? In this next election cycle, if the wrong president is elected, transgender might become more normal than it already is. Pedophilia might become legalized. They might take away the right for me to homeschool my children and insist that I send them to a government brainwashing facility. And there are reports that right now in Colorado that they're having uh, book readings and that transgender fellas are going to these book readings and that little kids, little young men, are going to these book readings dressed up as ladies and dancing for tips right now in the state of Colorado. We must contend for the faith. My Bible says that sodomy is wrong. It says that men dressing like ladies is wrong and women becoming men is wrong and sinful. And we have got to fight for these things. And if we don't, then our kids and our grandkids are going to be the ones who have to pay the price for what we didn't stand for, for what we didn't contend for. Again, consider the church in Corinth. Imagine if they stood in the gospel where they were taught. There would have been no room For them participating in temple prostitution, there would have been no room for incest in the church. There would have been no room for the confusion about which gift was best. There would have been no room for all of the debauchery that happened in that church. But they didn't contend for the faith. They didn't stand in the faith. They just said, okay, we'll let the walls down. We'll do what they're doing over there. That seems like a good idea. The faith is so important. Knowing what you believe is so important and knowing why you believe it is important. This is why I think about a year ago, I went through the Baptist distinctives and Pastor Davis taught through the 10 major doctrines because you've got to know what you believe and you've got to know why you believe them. And normally I say for kids and teens, when you're in your mama and your daddy's house, their convictions, their rules are your rules. But before you leave, you need to sit down with mama and daddy and find out why. Why did you not allow me to watch this? Why couldn't I go there? Why couldn't I wear that? Why did we go to church when the doors were open? And mama and daddy, you need to open the Bible, not quote me, not quote Pastor Davis, not read them a book. You need to show them in black and white where that standard came from. And then they can make that standard their own. And then when they're in a college and a teacher says that it's okay for a man to marry another man or says that gender is fluid or says that God is not real or says that creation is a lie, your young adult won't be persuaded by that nonsense. He'll be able to say, no, sir, this is what God's word says. And even if he doesn't argue with the teacher, he'll know in his mind, he'll argue in his mind, he'll be able to go to a fact and say, this is why that guy is wrong. You say, I intend for my child or young adult to go to a Christian college. There are still some well-intentioned men with some obscure belief who wish to take their obscure belief and mold the next generation. So your child needs to be able to look at the Bible, to go to God's word and say, look, this is why we believe that. This is what's going on here. So that a news anchor or a podcast host or an author or a YouTube star can't convince them of something that's false. They've got to know the body of beliefs. They've got to understand the faith. They can't fight for it if they don't know what it is and they don't know why it's there. And it's not just my job to teach them. It's not just Miss Becca's job to teach them or Mr. Dalton's job or Mr. Titus's job or Miss Booth's job or Miss Abby's job. We follow a curriculum in hopes that there's no hole in what we're teaching. But mama and daddy, it's your job to teach your kids the faith, the body of beliefs. And if you're going to teach them, the whole chapter hangs on whatever this one word means. I don't soon forget those things that I've studied, and neither will you. But studying. resting for understanding and more importantly you've got to put feet on the ground standing and contending are awesome they're things that we do you can know that you should be in the house of god you can tell your kids it's important to be in the house of god you can show them the verses and explain those verses more eloquently than spurgeon himself but when you decide to go fishing on a sunday instead of being in church you've filled your kids with this nonsense you're contending for what what the corinthians were contending 
gospel. They were contending for their freedom in Christ. They had to have their freedom. But unfortunately, that freedom turned into a license to sin. And we talked about how Paul said, yeah, you can do that, but is it expedient? Will it hurt your brother? Does it edify? Is it going to keep somebody from getting saved if you do that thing? Yes, you must know the faith. You must be able to teach the faith to your kids, but you must live it out. When I was younger, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, I think I have an example, a unique answer, I think, back to him. He said, when you can provide for a family. Providing for, for my family was really important to my dad. There were times where my dad worked three jobs. But my dad took me to the Bible and he showed me where it says in Timothy that if a man can't provide for his family, he's denied the faith, he's denied the body of belief that we're talking about. And it's worse than an infidel. But he didn't just show me, he didn't just teach me, he didn't just give it to me in black and white. He lived it every day. So now there may be some areas that I lack in. There may be some areas that I'm working hard to catch up in. But because of how my dad brought me up, because he drilled that into me and lived it out in front of me, I'll sell everything I own and I'll work day and night to provide for him. But Paul told us the second thing. He said, walk. Expect the devil to attack you, to attack your family. It's going to happen. Watch, be alert, be looking for it. He said, stand fast. Don't let the body, stand fast in the faith. Don't let the body of believers slip. Learn the teachings, fight for them, teach them to your kids and live them out every day. Watch, watch you, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Quit like men, act like men. What an important message for us to have today. And masculinity and men do as we are instructed to act and be like men. It's so important for us to understand what a real man looks like. And I'll be honest with you, I was confused about this. For a long time, I had a misunderstanding about what a real man looked like. There were two men who had a profound impact on me when I was in Alabama. One of them was Mr. Henry. The way Mr. Henry impacted me was not so much in my church when he said, you need to love your wife. The way that he impacted me was how he was dressed. We would see him, his hands were arthritic, and they were basically hooked at that point. He was, I think, in his early 70s. And no matter what, rain, shine, sleet, snow, which doesn't happen, he would get out of the car, walk around the car, and open the door for his wife. And you could see sometimes on his face the pain, because his hands didn't work enough, of opening that door handle, but he would do that for his wife. The times where I was at his house and his wife cooked us supper, he would thank his wife. And he really meant it. He wasn't just absurdly saying something, trying to teach me a lesson. He really meant what he was saying, thanking his wife. He loved his wife. A real man and a real man. I met another guy over there. His name was Paul Hayes. And to me, at this stage of my life, Paul was old. Paul was in his early 40s, maybe early 50s. Paul was the nicest guy you could ever meet. Paul helped us with our VBS. He helped with the kids. Paul acted like a little boy. There was a singing group that came to Paul's house, and they came to him and his wife very quickly. Our pastor took me aside and he said, hey, have you met Paul? Because Paul, I had been there for a couple of years, and Paul just kind of came out of nowhere. But apparently he had been a member for a long time. He said, hey, have you met Paul? He said, I know you like guns. Do you know who Paul is? Paul just retired. He's a special operations guy. He lived in a Connex box, and he slept during the day and shot terrorists in the face at night. And here's the thing. I had a hard time believing that Paul was who Paul was because Paul was the nicest guy I had ever met in my life. He was so kind. Fast forward several years, I was working in a shop with a guy named John. And John worked two jobs. He worked at Home Depot at night, and he worked at the shop during the day. John was, again, just such a kind person. I had never met somebody who was so genuinely nice. It seemed weird to me that this guy was this nice. He said, uh, the manager took me over and said, hey, how is things going working next to John? I said, it's going great. You know, he and I have talked about this. He said, oh, did you know that John was in First Recon during Desert Storm? I said, no, I didn't know that. And John brought me in a photo album, and he said, man, it was the most boring thing you could ever imagine. I had to dig holes in the desert and sit in the holes and watch bad guys do stuff. The most boring thing. But for me, it didn't sleep well. Because I was confused. I thought a real man was tough. And I thought that being tough meant being mean. I thought that being mean was being hard. And I thought that the special operations guys surely were the toughest guys I had met. And they are. 
But when I really met these guys, they were legitimately tough. And there were some really nice guys on the team. And that was a huge, huge, cosmically huge lesson for me to learn. Being tough doesn't mean that you're a dude. Being rude doesn't mean that you're a real man. A real man that's tough, you could cut his arm off and he won't even flinch. But a real man, he's rude to people. And you think about that gospel group who was rude to Paul, right? You heard Fabian. <laughs> but that's an important lesson, though, because Paul probably could have killed them in so many different ways. But here's the thing. Don't lose, don't lose focus. The, the, here's the thing. Paul had power under control. Paul was choosing to be meek. Meekness is not weakness. Real men are not weak. Real men are not soft. They're not whimpering. Real men choose, and this is so important, they choose to be humble. They choose to be meek. They choose to love. Those things, do you know what they are when we look at this verse? Like, look at the idea of pity. You're like, man, when a man can, can do those things, when he can be humble, when he can be meek, when he can show love to people who don't deserve love, then that's good. But man, these people at Corinth, who were men not just to be mean, but to be encouraging. He wanted them to understand. Sure, he wanted them to be courageous, to be willing to fight for the gospel, to die for the gospel if needed. But Paul wanted them to be mature, to be complete in their knowledge of the gospel, to grow up, to be able to understand the things he was teaching them so that they could teach others. Watch fast. Quit you like men. Stand, in the, stand fast in the faith. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Paul said this to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Before that, Paul gives us a whole bunch of verses about how husbands and wives are supposed to deal with each other, how husbands or fathers are supposed to deal with children, how we're just all of the interdynamics of social life. But I think the key to understanding all of these things, how to be strong in the Lord, how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, is found in 518 where it says, be not drunk with wine or is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. You and I were made strong by being filled, by being yielded to the Holy Spirit inside of us. This is why it's so very important for us to learn to hear the Holy Spirit. It's so important for us to not quench the Spirit. It's important for us as parents to teach our kids to obey, to obey the first time, to obey completely, and to obey with a good attitude. And here's why. And, and sometimes understanding the why will really be a help for you. He's, here's why. Because someday... The person giving your children direction and instruction, it's not going to be you. It may be the Holy Spirit. And they've got to be listening because he usually doesn't speak in a loud voice. And they've got to obey the first time because he might not tell them a second time. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, uh, chapter 12, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that I made apart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches in persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Paul, so that he did not get prideful, the devil hit him. God allowed the devil to hit him. And the idea there, I learned this somewhere where I was learning how to use a collapsible baton, and I don't remember where, and I didn't learn it that good. But kind of the key to using a collapsible baton, like, like, like lesson one, as you hit places where bone is next to skin, elbows, kneecaps, hands, bone is next to skin because it can cause the maximum amount of damage. And the idea here of, of being buffeted is to hit where it will cause the maximum amount of damage, where it will cause the most pain. Paul asked God three times to make it stop and said, God said back to Paul, my grace, you need to learn to rely on my grace. Paul needed to learn to, learn to rely on God's power, God's strength, that God was giving him, not in his own strength or ability. And when Paul was relying on, relying on that strength, the strength from God on the inside, that's when Paul was strong. Johnny Pope said this, the supernatural will never be activated until all natural has been eliminated or exhausted. If you can do it in your own strength, you will. It's not until you realize how weak your own strength is and learn to rely on God's strength that you'll know what Paul's talking about. And I learned this lesson the hard way here. 
And I'll close with this. When I was the youth pastor, we did youth on Friday nights. And Friday, you all know I work. Fridays tend to be a rush day, at least every other Friday, especially because it's the end of pay period and they want us to turn out as many hours as are humanly possible or unhumanly possible. So it would seem like every Friday, just the devil would beat me in ways that I couldn't understand, that I couldn't foresee. And by the time I got here, I was so physically, mentally, and emotionally worn out, I couldn't do it. And honestly, I got mad at God for it. I said, God, you have all power in the world. Why are you letting this happen? Why can't you give me a good day on Friday? Give me a good day so I can be rested, so I can do what your teens need me to do. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for them. Why are you letting this happen? And after having that conversation with God a few times, he brought this verse to my mind. He said, hey, dummy, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it so you can have real strength, so you can have real power. Because if you go in there on Friday night, doing it in your own capability, you're going to epic fail. I'm allowing you to get beat down so that you have no choice but to rely on me. And I started praying, God, I understand. You're allowing the devil to do this to me so that you can work through me. And I started thanking him for it. And you would be amazed if you saw me drive in here, worn out, tired, and sore, and you saw me get up out of that room from praying, you'd go, what happened? Like, like, did you drink all the energy drinks? And it wasn't an energy drink. It was the Holy Spirit. And then if you saw me three hours later on the way home, <laughs> you'd go, well, what happened? Like, you just had all the energy in the world. There was nothing left. But it was the Holy Spirit that did it. Listen to me. I had to learn this the hard way. You can learn this the easy way. You can learn from, from, from my ignorance. If you want power, real deal power, and I still have to do this sometimes. When I sit down to study, when I know what the text is, what I'm about to teach, I've got to go, God, I don't get this. Like, I don't know what this is supposed to mean. And I've got to spend time in prayer and in study. And when I say, God, I can't, it's when I feel like the Holy Spirit is standing right there going, it's okay, I got this, bud. And things start coming out of me that I'm like, wow, that's, that's cool. Did you, see, did you see that? But it's the Holy Spirit that does those things. It's not me. If you want that kind of power, that's what you've got to do. So Paul said, watch. Expect the devil to attack. He said, stand fast in the faith. You've got to know the body of beliefs. And when you know that body of beliefs, teach them to your kids, live them out. He said, be a man if you're a man. <laughs> but no matter who you are, be mature in the faith. Understand the gospel. Realize how weak that you are. And then allow God to give you the strength that you need. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I thank you for the many times where you've given me that strength. Father, I pray right now that you'll be with each of our people, Lord. You would help them to understand these principles and be able to apply them to your life. In your prayer, amen.